Welcome to World Talk with Friends, where the small world we live on becomes smaller as we discover neighborhoods all over the world by simply talking to our neighbors. This is Haggy Shack Radio Production, simulcast over Wolf Spirit Radio Network. Colleen Kelly is producing with friends Nancy, Nora, Neil, and those we have yet to meet. Welcome to our world. And we are live. Hello, everybody out there in Radio Land. This is Nancy Hopkins. You're listening to World Talk with Friends with Nora Willow and Neil Akash and Colleen Kelly producing from Haggy Shack. The date is uh, November 16th, 2016, and it's a wild ride we seem to be in. Uh, Nora, how are you doing today? <laughs> doing very good. Hi, everyone. And for those that don't remember, Nora is in Italy. Just and right. Yes, you are. And Neil, <laughs> Neil is in Bangladesh. And Neil, how's everything going over there? Um, everything's good so far. Pretty good. Thank you. Okay. Colleen, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Colleen, are you muted? I'm fine. The phone rang just as you asked me the question. So. There you go. Okay, go answer the phone. <laughs> um, we're having a... Um, well, the show today, I, I do want to um, find out from you guys what you might have picked up about the election, the U.S. election last week, and, you know, what what, what your own opinions are of it. So, um, uh, who wants to start first, Nora, Neil? Well, I guess Neil can start, because the last time we spoke, Neil wasn't on. We were with Barbara Three Crow. So, how about you start, mm-hmm. Neil? Okay. I don't mind. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I guess I'm going to start with uh, the fact that I never really paid attention to Trump until he actually won the election. Kind of stayed away from the drama, and I, I did follow some of these, some of the things, the strange things that was happening with Hillary, and she being. Uh, Putting into a car, it seems like she was arrested in chains and stuff like that. There was a lot of speculation about that. And then a Hillary clone appeared, who looked much younger, and all those drama were unfolding. And then Julian Assange, uh, WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks um, disclosed some of the, uh, actually a lot of the Hillary emails, which I didn't really get a chance to shuffle through myself, but I tried to find some articles that would do that, and I didn't really find a whole lot of stuff other than what I found interesting myself was that uh, Hillary supposedly uh, mentioned um, something about creating ISIS or funding ISIS, and this was a big thing for me because we've been trying to prove this for a while, try to t- tell people around here in my country that ISIS is actually, you know, is not what we, a lot of people think it is. So that was that. And then, ultimately, um, Trump won. And then, which was, I, for me personally, I didn't really care. I didn't, you know, it didn't matter to me because I did not want to lend my energies and consent to this whole system. So I stayed away from it. I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not, but that's how that, that, that was my stance. But after he won, there was this whole cry from people that, oh, my God, what's going to happen now? This demonic guy who's a racist by God and uh, white supremacist of some sort wants to build a wall to stop the Mexicans from entering, all kinds of hoopla started coming out. But at this time, at this point, I started paying attention to what he was all about because I had people telling me things and trying to guide me to know about Trump. And this is when I found out that Trump is actually a far better man than I thought he was. I started listening to his lectures, even from before and recent ones. And I was pleasantly surprised, actually. Uh, Of course, not all of my friends agree with me that he's uh, a good guy. And there's speculation and talks that he was a Mason. 
And of course, he, uh, I w- by the way, I was listening to Mark Passio uh, earlier today, and this was a really, really good uh, speech by Mark. I didn't listen to the whole thing, but he was, uh, I think the title was, it was with uh, Alfred Lambermont Weber, and he was basically talking about how people are not awake, and people do not understand that we are controlled by occult magic. And if we don't understand this, that means we're not really awake. So, so this, this was just one of his main points. And I agree. Even though I don't understand occult myself very well, I try to find out, but so far I haven't uh, made that much progress. But I agree with him that most people, even people who think they're awake, aren't really awake because it, it's kind of a kind of a delusion. Maybe it, it applies to myself as well. And people have told me that. People, people did. So, so we need to be careful about what we're doing. And I think it was uh, what I found a positive thing and very interesting about the American election is that people are very, very focused on it. And because of that, this is, I think this is different from before. And people are actually interested in finding out what's going on, you know. Even if, even if, even if the mainstreamers, those we are. They don't really get into the... All the conspiracy that... Cover. We're losing Neil. Yeah, yeah, we seem we seem to. Okay, Neil. I, I, Neil, you're, you're you're I don't I don't. Actually, <coughs> got more. Neil. Right. You, you're right. get you're breaking up really bad, Neil. This is the corporate USA is a. You can't hear us. Yeah. Neil, can you hear me? Neil. Let me take a break. Okay. L- 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 You're breaking up, so I'll, I'll pause here. Okay. Y- you actually were breaking up also. Um, so l- let's just, uh, I, th- I think it's just a slow connection. Let's see if it sets itself okay. Let's let Nora, um, okay. what, what, she's, what she uh, observed, and then we'll come back to you. Um, hopefully no it'll just settle down. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Neil. Um, I I do agree very much with every statement you've made. Um, well, there are a few things that you brought up. I mean, regarding the occult, for example, yeah, that's to my knowledge and to my you know belief is that yes, there is occult magic uh, in the higher echelons, and um, if we don't understand that, then we don't under, we we won't be able to understand the um the reality of things and of course the system um the education you know they make you believe that all this is not true and that it's just hocus pocus and it's all you know um just just unreal stuff and whoever believes in it is crazy uh, i personally believe in it very much i've seen it in my own life um and and yes i think that's a big driving force in politics and and everything that is uh, ruling the system. Now, regarding Trump and this, you know, the whole system, how it works, I don't know. A lot of people say that he's outside of the system. Um, He's actually a positive change because if it was Hillary, then we would keep going with the same system. I tend to agree with that. But we don't know what kind of change is Trump going to bring. He did say some positive things, but he... Now, my problem with Trump is it is one specific problem. Um, he seems with his. He doesn't realize that um, as a person who has the privilege and the opportunity to speak to the people, he has a huge responsibility. Now, let's put aside everything else. You know that we create our reality and we uh, we have the magic within us to to change things and put love in people's hearts. I believe in that, but we just want to talk reality in the, in another sense he has instigated a lot of people he has encouraged negative stereotypes 
Um, and unfortunately, uh, that that could trigger some reactions in people who already have issues. For example, racism um, and a, a, a narrow, closed mind. That's my worry. And we're starting to see that a little bit. Now, I keep saying, because it's easy for me to say it, let's give it a chance. Some people feel that they cannot because their life depends on it, because their family's life depends on it. I totally understand that. Um, this is the thing. We don't know how things are going to unfold. So a lot of things that he has said are positive, and a lot of things that he has said were not that positive, which have triggered the people. And people are very easily controllable. You know, if you start... Uh, speaking to them in a certain way, telling them what they want to hear, they're going to get excited. So, um, especially in mass psychology, people tend to react. So they, they don't find their center uh, very easily because they're not brought up that way because of the system, because of society, because of education. So it's a, to me, it's a very complex thing. It's very hard to just put one fixed solution to it that this is how it is. There's so many things just involved in it. I don't know if I'm, I was able to um, deliver my thoughts on this, but this is kind of what I have to say about it for now. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Colleen, Colleen probably would agree with you. Last night's show, she was, you know, pointing to the same thing about how a lot of people are full of fear because of what he has said. Um, but if it had been the other way, I mean, right now, there's a lot of people full of fear from the Clinton side because he's in. Never mind what he said, just because she didn't make it. There's um, fear. Yes, he can I interject? Sure here for a second. Uh, I just happened to um, run into a video that was made by some, uh, probably an Indian guy in the United States most likely. And this was about the, the, the things that were being broadcast about Trump, the things he had said uh, during the election campaign. Have you guys seen this? That it was a cut cut and paste kind of thing that they cut out oh, yeah, I saw phrases it. and words. Right. So they made him, they really demonized him. And racist. And the actual statement was much more moderate and thoughtful, but the propaganda was you know, they cut out the words and phrases and certain facial expressions to create a wrong impression on people. Did you see this? It's very, very important, I think. Because yeah. this is what people are acting on these videos that are, like, edited and specially made to create fear and racism. And I think this needs to be stated. I have yeah. not, I, yeah, I have not seen it, Neil, but I realized it was going on simply by watching what was, was happening because the, and I was, initially I wasn't even paying any attention and then um, I started to w listen to the MSNBC, CNN type of people and what I was getting was these, the, he couldn't possibly <clears throat> have been standing up there saying all those things that they say he said that were so negative and nothing else. You know, all you heard was the negative things, and yes, it felt like they were all real tiny sound bites. So <clears throat> I knew it was happening, even if I haven't seen this, and um, hopefully you'll get me that, that link. I would like to see it. Um, go ahead, Nora. You wanted to say something. No, I, I just wanted to uh, thank Neil for bringing that up because I saw that video and the, he's absolutely right. He's abs I think, wasn't it Colleen? Colleen, I think it was you who posted it. Or maybe it was another friend on Facebook. But, but yeah, I saw it. it. It was shocking. But I'm not surprised. I mean, that's one of the oldest uh, tricks in the media. Well, we, editing. <coughs> we just lost Neil. Uh, Colleen, did you realize Neil got dropped? He said that his network is acting up and then he got dropped. So, yeah, I see uh, that. I'll try to bring yeah. him back in. I don't know if we'll be able to, but I'll try. Okay. Um, the thing about it that, that I found really interesting, Nora, was that 
we were being presented this, the, the, he's attacking the Latinos, he's attacking the blacks, he's attacking all of these different individuals and different groups. And Neil, you back? Maybe, maybe not. All right. He's, he's, he's up. I'm not sure he's in back, though. Well, he's speaking, apparently, but we're not hearing anything. Right. Huh. Okay. Neil, we're not hearing you. Can you hear us? Just message. Yeah. Oh, you okay. can? Okay. I can hear you guys. Okay, good. Good. Let's, let's hope we're going to be able to hear you. Um, but when the election actually happened, there were a lot more Latinos that voted for him than anybody would suspect. And also, there was a lack of voting in the black community for, for the election completely. So if all these people were listening to him and getting irate because of the things he was saying, they certainly weren't reacting that way. And I don't know how to explain it other than the fact that they may not have been paying attention either, like a lot of people weren't. Um, right. You know, but the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that when you, <clears throat> when you see the can, candidate and what, how they were mucking around with what he was saying, of course, the mass media can do the same even if he's president. You know, the fact that the man could be a wonderful man, able to do all these things. Our presentation through the mass media is just hogwashed. We really don't know what's going on if that's what all we're looking at. And I think it's happening right now. What, what's happening? The media is still publishing things that are not really entirely true and just propaganda they're using Trump as a president now saying things about him and stuff he wants to do I think it's going on I, I, I don't even know those things are true or not well Colleen just wrote in the messages uh, it's been said that there was a lack of voting in black communities because millions of voters were taken off the ro rolls the voting rolls um, oh. interesting yeah First Personally, I, 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 I kept saying to people, it doesn't matter because they're going to be controlled. You're going to be controlled. You know, you can't look at it that way. Don't put your energy into it. Put your energy into a new reality. And that was the way. I, I agree with you, Neil, that you didn't want to put any of your energy in it. And I, that was what I was feeling too. Don't put your energy into it. But when I was doing the show on Tuesday. Uh, the, the night that the boat, the voting was Tuesday and they were counting the votes, um, Colleen was keeping an eye on what was happening and Walt and I were basically doing a show with, you know, and what's, what's happening over at Election Center? And then by 8 o'clock, an hour into the show, I suddenly became, uh, I, I, I suddenly sort of got download about timeline, timeline, timeline. And um, that's when I said, you know, maybe maybe we shouldn't worry about who it is that actually gets in because <clears throat> maybe we can control them, think of them as working for us, give them all the light and love and open their hearts, open their minds, open their, you know, just on, uh, if, if we work to, build, to keep the new timeline energized versus the old timeline. And... Um, Walt appeared to be thinking that Clinton was going to win, as everybody was. I didn't, you know, have any indication this Trump phenomenon was real. Um, and he says, well, they don't, they don't even have a heart because they don't even have a soul. And he goes off on the, you know, concept of cloning and concept of true, true evil. And uh, But I, I just felt like even then, even then, even if it was her, you know, because of what we did, when we worked with the with freeing the green man from the takeover by the archangel or the whatever it was the devil um we talked about that the last time you were on that nor and right. i 
got into a weird thing, and we, we stopped Pan, the head of the gin, from being uh, actually possessed by the negative entity of Archangel Michael, I mean, excuse me, Archangel Lucifer, or what we know as Satan, the devil. And that that, w- that produced a different timeline, one that had a path in it that said the evil never really existed on this timeline, and nobody has the karma associated with it, even the people that did this awful stuff. And shortly after that, I realized, or maybe even then, that what we're really doing is we're trying to get back to the Garden of Eden timeline, the reality of the Garden of Eden. We got thrown out of it, but that doesn't mean it stopped existing. Maybe we should have been trying to get back there from the get-go, and maybe that's what we have been doing. So I was really, you know, had been working in my head about all these timelines and shiftings and, and this sort of thing. So after the show, when the show ended, of course, that and every mainstream media person was saying something happened at 8 o'clock at night, which was when I felt that this timeline shift regarding the election itself, you know, really focused in on the election, had shifted. And I spent the rest of the night, hours and hours, uh, watching one improbable state after the other going for Trump. And every time it would happen, I'd start laughing again. It was like, this is ludicrous. This isn't conforming to any kind of polls or what, you know, even history. It was like a brand new election, never never, never been seen before. They were getting states that had been uh, for the opponents for, you know, decades and decades. Um, then I got a, uh, an email, a uh, message from uh, Stephanie Dietz who said, Go check out what Starfire Tor was talking about. And Starfire is somebody that you would really find fascinating, Neil, I think, because she gets into uh, timelines and uh, timeline adjustments, uh, just amazing stuff. And I've been watching her for over a decade, and she has never failed in my watching her. She'll say... There's going to be a a CME, a a blast of energy from the sun, and it's going to cause this, this, and this. And sure enough, this, this, and this happens. She's very accurate, but she also has the ability to, um, she calls it psi view, which is psi being PSI view, uh, to be able to kind of like look at different realities. It's sort of like remote viewing on steroids in that, she is actually looking at different timelines. She can see see the timelines there. And there were timelines where Hillary was president, and there was timelines when Trump was president. Every time she looked at Hillary, she was caught in a loop. She called it a nuclear event loop. And what was happening was that if you followed the timeline where she's president, it always ended in a nuclear catastrophe. Whereas she looked at Trump and it would all be okay. Everything was fine. There was no nuclear catastrophe. So she decided to, in August of last year, to actually go out and say something about what she was seeing because she also felt that by that time that she, this looping t- nuclear thing she had known about for a very long time but had never said anything because she didn't know what to do about it. She didn't want to, to, you know, have people become fearful. So she goes into a, uh, like a a program, let's call it just a program, of explaining now what she's seeing versus, you know, the the election and telling about this nuclear looping reality. And she said that she believed that her people could come together and actually influence the election. Not just who wins, but the type of person who would win. And she went through and listed a series of things that she thought the President of the United States would need to um, have as an ability or have as a position in order to make the changes that she believed would be positive change. So she got her people to do a, a sort of like an experiment and 
compare what she was saying as protocol to either of the candidates. This is my understanding of how it worked. And Trump was the one that kept getting the, yes, he's the go man, he's the go man. So then she enlisted uh, angelic support for what she was doing, and she was calling it astral tra tagging, but really to me it sounded like, um, you know, just opening up your, your, your energy field and saying, no, we need Trump, we need Trump to win, not because he's Trump, but because he is holding these capabilities, these characteristics that this new leader is going to have. Um, so right after the, the, the next day, she was like, we won, we won. You know, the, the Hillary reality is dying off, and now we've got the Trump reality. And if you look at it from the standpoint of a total timeline change, you're not dealing with the same person, the same Trump that was the campaigner that was on the old reality line. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, <laughs> you see that. what I'm saying? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay? Yep. So, and, and, and I hadn't even seen that yet. I hadn't even seen what she said. I did the show with you guys, and I immediately hung up. Oh, oh I'm sorry, it wasn't you, Neil. It was Barbara Threecrow. And I hang up, and I go, and I pull up a picture. I mean, uh, the video of Trump's, uh, you know, acknowledgement of winning speech. It happened after I went to bed. I couldn't stay up for it. And so I'm, I'm watching, and they've got the camera pointed to the, the back of the stage where the curtain is, and he's going to come out from behind this curtain. And, I'm, and it was, you know, quite a few minutes before he actually came out. And when he did, I actually burst out crying because the man did not look the same. The man's energy right. is completely different. And I realized, oh, my God, there has been a massive energy cha uh, timeline change, even though I hadn't even read, you know, what Solaris, um, uh, what uh, Starfire Tor had said. So then it got even better because then he's on the stage, and then this little boy, 10-year-old boy, comes and stands next to him. And then I guess his wife, the boy's mother, was beyond them, but all you could really see on the in the in the video was Trump with his ten year old. And as soon as I laid eyes on him, I'm like, Oh my God, this is a star kid. Who is he? And then I'm putting it in my head and I'm going, Wait a minute. Trump does have a son by Ivana, his wife, and he was I, I didn't think he'd be ten years old. It seems like it only happened about five years ago. But it turns out this is their son and his name is Baron. And as I watched him I realized that he is I, 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 there is some confirmation out there that he is at least mildly autistic, which is an indicator that you may have a star child uh, for a lot of reasons. But I was just like, where did this guy come from? Where did this kid come from? He's never, I've never seen him out there. Is you know, and, and and it was like a timeline change that, you know, not only is he looking different, but the entire look of his family is different. He has a 10-year-old star child standing next to him as he accepts the president-elect. You know, I mean, I was like yeah. absolutely blown away. And right. I think, and some, I, go ahead. Uh, did you pull something about his hair color changing? I, I was just going to say that. <laughs> well, that okay. yeah. go ahead. No. Good yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. the next thing I did. I've learned that when we have major timeline changes... Very often, the photographs change of the people that, you know, just like they dead people all of a sudden are alive, well, also photographs change. So I said, okay, when was the last time I, and, and the only image I have of him in my head prior to him walking out from behind that curtain was this red-orange thing that was laying on his head. I mean, it doesn't even look like hair to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, I'm not the most observant <laughs> person, but... You know, that was my image of him. So I said, okay, when was the last time I saw him? And I said, okay, it was the third debate. I was actually studying him, okay? And so I pull up the picture, and I said, okay, that's the picture I remember. And I sit there, and I go, okay, let me just put in Donald Trump and images, Google images. And I was really shocked at that moment because two-thirds of the pictures were the orange-red thing I had in my head. But a good third of them were um, white-haired, gray-haired, 
you know, and I'm going like, oh, wow, this is the Mandela effect, and it's going to get more intense, I said to myself. So um, I luckily did not close out that window. I left that window open, even though I didn't look at it again for at least eight hours, maybe ten hours. And, uh, yeah, I was shutting down, and I, I shut down things I might not want the next day. So I went, oh, yeah, let me look at this. And I pushed it on, and I was like, oh, my God. I did not see one of those red pictures. They were all gray. They were all white. And once in a while, you'd see this ginger colored. But the vast majority of them now, he was white-haired or, or slightly gray-haired. It, none of this red thing laying on his head. <laughs> so, you know, that was another indicator of a massive timeline change. Yeah, I, I think I felt it myself, Nancy, because uh, my feelings completely changed about him. And every time I listen to him now, he sounds like a very, very sensible man. And he's not just uh, speaking the party line. He actually, he actually talks like he knows what he's talking about and doesn't really care about, you know, the mainstream stuff at all. Yep, yep, I agree with you. Yeah, I have to confirm the hair thing shocked me as well. So you remember I, the red hair? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I do. And, you know, on the Google search, you don't see those, at least me, I don't know if my memory is playing tricks, but, yeah, I haven't... As a matter of fact, I, didn't I did one. the same. Come to think of it, I did the same, and I didn't see any orange color hair either. But do you remember it being orange, Neil, before? I kind of had this image in my head. I'm not sure anymore, but... Uh, you see, that's weird. <laughs> why, are we, why do we all have this image? I mean, we've seen Trump for years. Right. And uh, it can't just be something in our collective imagination. Now, something, an interesting observation I'd like to make regarding timelines and, you know, the shift of reality. There are a lot of people that say, you know, they don't believe in it and, um, you know, I only believe it if I see proof. There's just a little thing I'd like to say, and I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this already. Uh, if we look at science, quantum physics to be specific, there have been done, there, there have done experiments where they see, uh, um, you know, the, um, is it the nucleus? Oh, my God, I don't remember right now. Or is it the uh, electrons? They pop in and out, okay? And in super high speed. Now, the thing is, when they observe it, they see it, you know, they see it one moment, and another moment, it's gone. So it vanishes. And scientists are perplexed because they don't know where it goes. Now, my intuition tells me there's an explanation for that. What does this mean? If we are made of this, our body is made of this, everything is made of this, and it pops in and out of existence between brackets, our reality, then where does it go when it vanishes? So this means that every part of our being is here and somewhere else as well. What I believe is the, uh, the, the, the change uh, in, in our world is the shift of our awareness. So the moment we realize that we are here, but we are somewhere else as well, then we start to see. We start to become aware of changes. I don't know if I'm able to explain myself again, because these, these subjects are a little bit complicated, and sometimes, you know, you, even when you try to explain them, you can get lost while, while explaining them. But do you get my I mean, do you get the gist of what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. and as a matter of fact, what happens is that <clears throat> in the very beginning of quantum physics, they realize, they would say, okay, um, what, maybe it'll do, maybe a fo you're talking about photons, maybe the photons... Photon yeah. Maybe the photon will do this if we do that. And they do it, and by God, the photon did what they thought it would. Yeah. That became a problem, all right, because they realized that whatever they thought was going to happen, their thoughts were influencing whether the photon was here or there. And it doesn't disappear. It goes into a wave. So no, that's another experiment. 
I'm, I'm actually talking about not, that's the double slit experiment I think that you're talking yes. about, where yes. when you don't observe it, it turns into a wave, but when you observe it, it actually goes where you because observe exact, it. Because exactly what you said. The focus of their thoughts was on it, and so they stabilized the wave as a 3D image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was another experiment they did as well. Now, I don't know if, now I'm actually... I hope I'm not confused, but I do remember very specifically that they were also talking about it popping in and out. So, because usually when something becomes, um, uh, you, you don't see it, you still see the traces of it. So, because it's very, very fast and it moves in supersonic uh, motion, they only see the traces of it. That's what, I mean, at least the videos and what I've read, this is what they were explaining. But they say there are moments where actually it disappears completely. These are all things that are like in very, very short instances. I mean, they're, they're, um, uh, they're, they're how can I say? They're measured in a, in a, in a very, very small way. I well, what, I see, what I see happening is you've got a wave, okay? Like, let's say you've got a radio wave out there, okay? A radio wave has a carrier wave, which is a frequency known by the, the receivers. If there is other stuff on that carrier wave, other frequencies, that's the database. Okay? So all these televisions all over the place are seeing the same wave, but their televisions are responding to a piece of that wave because they just take off the message, take off the message, take off the message. I think that, that the universe is sort of the same thing in that Nancy Hopkins is only one slice of the wave. And that wherever that yeah. wave is, there's another image of me. You understand that? Can you yes. Understand? Yeah, it makes sense, Nancy. Yeah. Okay. All right. So when you focus on it, I've, 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 I've tried to explain timelines like every decision you have in your life, you can go right or left. Okay, if you go right, that's where your attention is, that's where your energy is, that's the timeline that keeps going because you put your energy into it. So in the case of what we're encountering now, you've got Donald Trump that was on, on a particular path, okay, but there was also Donald Trump that was on a different path, a different reality. The one that we created or have reconnected with the Garden of Eden thing. And in the reality that we're shifting to, there was no takeover, domina domination of Earth by evil. The green man, instead of Pan, the, the personification of Satan, is the dominant history. So this guy that we're seeing now has always been there, since we recognized a secondary reality. I'm kind of getting lost here myself, so I'm not sure yeah. if I'm making sense. No, but, you're right. You know, so the Donald Trump that is on the reality of, let's say, let's just call it the Garden of Eden kind of reality, okay? It's not the Garden of Eden yet, but it's, we're getting closer to it, okay? Because you've got all these different versions of time, timelines associated with a reality. Now, what I mean by that is that if I decide to go to the right, Nor decides to go to the right, and Neil decides to go to the right, then we are in a similar reality because our timelines are all merging into, you know, the right path. So if you, if you think in terms of that, the right path is just another path that's open to us. The fact that we as human beings make a decision to not follow the left path and don't put our focus into it, means that is not a dominant path. But in the case of something as stable as the Garden of Eden, there have been these secondary timelines that even though nobody was paying attention to them, they were still continuing. And it's almost like you've got uh, markers. I think of them as markers. It's like... The energy that is Donald Trump or Nancy Hopkins or Nor is, is in that reality, but nobody's paying attention to it. So it's sort of exactly. just, you know, stagnant. It's just sitting there waiting, waiting. Is anybody going to pay attention to me? 
And so when Starfire Tour got thousands of people to work with her, she's very popular. Um, when she got those people to focus in on not Donald Trump the candidate, but Donald Trump the president, who could do all these amazing things, now the focus of her people ended up affecting the super consciousness, the collective consciousness of humanity. They were actually projecting a new thought, a new reality matrix into the mix. And they were not alone. You know, all of us were doing it. I said, I said during the election, I said, look it, if this man is somebody who's going to make all the changes, it's because we wanted those changes. We are creating the reality. He works for us. He's an image of a leader that we want. And so, you know, I think it, it comes from humanity waking up, recognizing another reality, putting our energy into that reality, and turning on the Trump that had really always been there, but nobody was paying attention. He was just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. Is that yeah, and there's the out. Can I add something to this? Please. Um, basically, I have some friends who still think that um, even though Hillary was plan A for the cabal, uh, Trump was really plan B, nothing, nothing less than that. But I personally don't believe that, just intuitively, even though it may be the case, but I, do, I don't feel that way at all. And I think what happened is our collective conscious managed to pull off an, an election that Hillary Clinton did not win, and this was the sign signifying factor that created a much better reality, that kind of uh, clicked into a better reality with a better president as, a click, as uh, I'm sorry, Trump as a better president, even a better man than we thought he was. Suddenly everything's in it, everything's shifted, and everything much more positive than we thought it was. And this is how I personally feel, and I think these feelings are important rather than listening to everybody and trying to figure out what's going on. And I think there, there is a faction of the people who feel that this was actually pulled off by the cabal. They wanted Trump as opposed to Hillary because she was sick or for whatever reasons. But I personally don't agree with that at all. I feel that it is we who pulled it off pulled off an election that's actually better for the people. No, It doesn't, as you said, it doesn't really matter who Trump was before. What matters is who he is now. And he's probably, it seems to us that he's actually a different person altogether because we are on a different, far better timeline than we were even last week. The week Absolutely. Before the election. Right. Well, within hours of the election, really. Yeah, well, I know that's yeah. happen. I mean, very seldom do you see you have all these people that say it happened at, after eight o'clock on the election night. You know, it was like boom, all of a sudden. And, and uh, something you said, Neil, about uh, you weren't paying any attention to it, but then when you found out he had one, you start, felt good. So your reaction was to feel good about it. Dolly had said something very similar. She had been listening to our show said, I'm not going to listen to this crap about the election, went to bed. But when she woke up, she woke up with this feeling of optimism, this feeling of, oh, wow, something's changed. So even though she wasn't paying any attention to it, she felt it immediately when she woke up. A lot of people, right. something happened, something happened. You know, they well, I found the difference. Well, I found it very strange that some people who I don't necessarily judge as very awake um, they said that, they said something quite profound. They said, I prefer that Trump, I'm, okay, so they're like, we're not 100% enthusiastic, but in, Trump shows some sort of change, because if Hillary would have won, things would have continued. So this kind of gave me a proof that they are aware that there is, you know, a system that that is continuing and it's being, you know, repeated and repeated over and over again. So, to me, that was a very good sign that they were aware of this. But, Nora, did you that. notice... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting, sorry. No, Did you ahead. notice the faction of the people around you that uh, were very frustrated and really worried that he won? Did you... Any, any of you guys felt this or saw this? 
Yeah, there was a little bit of tension, I believe, at the beginning. Okay. But it I seems like things are cooling down. Okay. For me, this is basically on Facebook. Some people are really, really negative, and there's a lot of uh, riots and stuff like that happening. Is, is, did that really happen, or was it a fake media thing? Well, I saw a posting in Craigslist that was saying, um, basically, come out and protest. We'll pay you $15 an hour. <laughs> oh, George wow. Soros. So, you know, <laughs> what can I tell you? That's a good one. Uh, I do know of, of one young lady. She's a college student who put together people, and it was not so much to protest in the streets, but to get together and talk, <coughs> excuse me, about what had happened. What are your fears? What, 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 what you know, why, you know, what, what do you think about, you know, so there were some real people concerned that did get together, but I did see this posting in Craigslist. Now, whether that was some plant or not, I don't know, but, um, <coughs> Yeah, there's, not, there's, nothing that, there's nothing they can do about it. Well, I think that there are legitimate protests. Now, as far as okay. the rioting and the looting and all of that, so much of that, to me anyway, seems like those false flag events that go on everywhere or where right. peaceful protests are infiltrated by some unknown group. That Every time. Yes. So I think that there are people who are protesting for whatever reason, but I think that they're being infiltrated and all of that um, for an agenda. Which I Pauline, think. thank you for saying that, but I think I need to cover one more thing about this, is that because I, I represent a large group of, group of Muslims, at least I feel that way, because the people around me are all Muslims. So, and I think Muslims basically had a fear of Trump because of the media propaganda, because of the edited videos that I told, told you guys about earlier, because they really bastardized what he said, and it made it sound like he was just, he hated Muslims and he wanted everybody out of, out of the United States. It, it kind of gave that impression to a lot of people. That's where, and I think that's where the fear came from initially, but I don't know if it still exists or not. I'm sure it still, I'm sure it still does. And of course, that, 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 no, let, let's, just, let's just look at this from, from a practicality standpoint. The weirdness about the U.S. election is that he's the president-elect, but he's not the president-elect because the people of the United States, state by state, vote. Those populations have, based on population, have a representative of the electoral college. Now, this is so bizarre, and you go like, What? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. like in Florida, you've got a whole bunch of um, people here, so you have a, a larger number of electoral college votes. And the people who are made the electoral college voters, they are not compelled by law to vote as their state did. Now, never has anybody voted other than what their state did. But the reality is is that this is not a done deal yet they could still somehow muck with this if the electoral college decided not to agree with the states and to bring in uh, Hillary instead of him I don't think it's going to happen but I think that it's not going to happen if we put our energy into making it not happen if you okay. If, okay if I was if I was um, somebody that said because I I absolutely believe that um, Trump was not the pick of the call they don't want this man in here why well for one thing he's he's a friend of um, 
InfoWars' Alex Jones. Now, people go, well, I wouldn't listen to Alex Jones. Well, listen to Alex Jones. Not how he delivers the message, but some of the things he says. The man is very brave. He has gone and he has, he has brought things to, uh, in the, into the open that other people didn't do. I know he's a loudmouth. He irritates the crap out of me. I never listen to him. But I know what he says. And right, I agree with he's you. He's talking about chemtrails, and he's talking about the Federal Reserve, and he's talking about all the things that we talk about. And Donald Trump, Trump is listening to him. You've got to say, well, maybe Trump is a very great danger to the cabal. Because he also is not, he paid for the election. He didn't have these groups that were giving him money. Okay, so he owes nobody anybody, anybody anything as far as that goes. We know that he's so opinionated he won't even listen to his own people. That's the old Trump. But what does that signify in the new Trump? It signifies somebody that leads from the gut. And that was one of the things that I found um, extremely frustrating with Obama, is he did not have that gut instinct leadership thing he was always, and, and Hillary too. Well, you know, that's what the emails were showing, Neil, was that, oh, well, if we do this, then that's going to happen, and let's do this. There was no feeling of, you people know what you want. You no, know, it came off like you people completely analyze and contrive and, 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 you know, try to do things that work best for you, not best for the situation. That was one of the more disturbing things about those emails. And so my, my feeling here is that the Trump that, that I see as being able to lead us into a new place is going to come from inside a human being that, in fact, was brought up under the, in, in, but the minister, Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking. So let's look at that for a second. This man, and what, what, what Vincent Peale tells you is reality is what you think it is, so damn well think of reality you want. And he would say, think of what you want, and no matter what happens, don't let go of that vision. Even if things seem to be bad, just assume that they're there for some purpose that you don't understand because you are going to get to your goal, the image you've put in your mind. All right. So you got somebody who comes along, is a Democrat, doesn't see a path to um, the White House through go the Democrats. So he goes and becomes a Republican. Then the Republicans say, "Oh hell no," and he says, "Fine, I'm going to destroy you because I see myself as being the nominee," and nobody could, could could stop him. I mean, he virtually tore the Republican Party apart. So then he goes, and now he's he's the Republican nominee and he tears the Democratic Party apart because he believed in himself in the vision that he had and yeah you say things as a camp in a campaign environment does he believe him maybe he did but in this new reality he still got that core understanding of imagine it and it will happen so he's very dangerous to the cabal um, one of the things that he said, he's going to open 9-11. You open up the 9-11 investigation again. If you do it right this time, you're going to have a total change in everything. You know, because first off, the Saudis are going to look really dirty. The Clintons look really dirty. The Bushes look really dirty. The whole thing that we've been saying is, will come to light. So... Right. If he goes, if he yeah. got, now, uh, just a practical thing, the, the infrastructure of the United States is falling apart. And decade after decade, the Republicans have refused to allow any, you know, building of highways and bridges. They don't, nobody understands why, but if they're all working for the cabal and they want to keep us weak, well, that makes sense. Donald Trump doesn't understand weak. He's going to make us strong again. You know, so so, it, but it's the imaging that he's doing. He's seeing himself in the new reality. 
because he grew up under Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking. Right. And yeah. I saw him on a on a TV show with uh, Charlie Rose. Have you guys seen it? He was being asked kind of tough questions whether uh, removing or killing Gaddafi was right or wrong. And he did say it was wrong. He straight up he said it was wrong. The, you know, American foreign policy is oftentimes ignorant and self-serving and all those things. So, so as a matter of fact, I listened to one of his older audios about 9-11 Twin Tower crash. This was very, very interesting. And he, there he was basically talking about visiting the Twin Towers back then, b before 9-11. And he, he, had a, he had his own structural engineer with him who explained to him that the, the Twin Towers were actually made different than any other towers. And it was actually uh, I-beamed with steel, steel beams, steel I-beams all around the structure. And it was so thick and so closely knit that it would be impossible. Even if a plane hit it, hit that structure, it wouldn't even penetrate. So he, listening to his own, own structural engineer, Trump was saying that to him it seemed like they had to have bombs in that building because there's no way the plane could have done this kind of damage to the building, the whole thing pulverized. But this, is, this recording, I think, was from 2001. So back then he had enough self-integrity to say, you know, go against the, the official party line. So this was interesting for me. So the old Trump wasn't really a bad guy in my eyes because, you know, he could speak his mind back then. And that means, he, you know, he has his personal integrity and doesn't really care. He, he, he speaks the truth, which I really appreciate it. I just wanted to throw that in there. And I guess I'm done <laughs> oiling Trump for now. Thank you. Well, guys. listen, listen we're, at the top of, we're, we're at the top of the hour. So let's take a quick break and we'll come back and uh, continue talking. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, Colleen, you got something? I do. It's a long one, so just let me back. No. Let me know when you're back. We will. All Thank right. you. Okay. We'll be right back. All right, guys. Alrighty, we are back. And so it is. <laughs> uh, you're listening to Haggy Shack's production of World Talk with Friends over simulcast over Wolf Spirit Radio. You can go to wolfspiritradio.com and you can donate or you can also become a member for five dollars a month and have access to all the archives. The archives for um, every given week's live show is up in a free archive for a week that you can download if you'd like. Um, and then Haggy Shack is haggyshack.com, and that is got a donation button, too. If you donate there, $30 or more, you can get three S4 stickers. Um, you can get more information on me at cosmicreality.net. Nora, what is your, it's, it's conscious, what, what's your website? Oh, it's consciousnessconnected.com, but at the moment it's, uh, I, I've published it because I'm kind of reconstructing it a little bit, working on it, so yeah, if, if I mean, anyone tries to get in, you won't find it at the moment, but yeah, as soon as I get it published and fixed, I'll, I'll let you know for sure. And say it again, consciousnessconnected.com. Com. And Neil, I know you have a blog. Um, how can they get to your blog? And you also are available on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, mine is Neil Baul. That's N E O B A U L. Dot blogspot. Dot com. Excellent. And of course, Hag Haggyshack. Dot com. Um, okay, so. Anybody got any more that they want to, they thought about, they'd like to add to that conversation? I'm, I'm good. good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Um, is there anything you guys want to talk about? I, as a matter of fact, I do, Nancy. I good. do have Yay. something in mind, but uh, why don't we let Nora speak for a while? 
Oh, you, I mean, if you have something in mind that you'd like to talk about, go ahead. At the moment, I, I don't have anything specific on my mind. All right. Nancy, how about you? you did you want us to hear this too? No, no, go, go for it. Go, no, go for it. All right. So I was trying to, uh, what I try to do is try to meditate on a program before I do it so that I don't make a complete fool out of myself. <laughs> so try to get guidance on what I should be saying and stuff like that. And one of the guidances I received was that right now there is a kind of, I want to prefix what I was going to say with one thing, that um, this election that we just talked about, um, this is definitely a marker of some, 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 some sort in our flow of consciousness because time doesn't really exist. So certain events happen, need to happen before something else, some other events can happen. This is, I think, one of the ways to understand uh, how our reality um, flows. So this, I think, this uh, this um, election was one of those one of those events that would take us to the next step. And the other thing is because we already talked about that these elections are not really real. That as we used to think, they are facade, and there is a, a whole lot more going on behind the scenes in the deep state and the Rothschilds and the neo-Nazis and uh, Jesuits and all those people, including the Syrians, Pleiadians, and Reptilians, uh, Zeta Reticuli, and stuff like that. So, uh, one of the things I was guided to talk about on this radio show was that right now there is some sort of a of a uh, contention, I would say, a conflict of interest between maybe the Anunnaki and our real creators. We, I think, uh, we do radio shows talking about creation myth of humanity, Homo sapiens, and I think one of the it's important right now for everyone to understand our real power, I mean, where we want to take our reality, like you were saying before, that we need to have a vision. And it doesn't really matter what happens on the so-called external reality. If we hold on to our, our vision, the, the, the reality that we prefer, it will manifest. And if we can, one of the, I think I was reading on one of the photos you posted, Nancy, where you said one of the rules of uh, cosmic cosmic rules, I think, or cosmic reality rules, I forget the exact term, that uh, rule number one is reality is whatever you think it is. And rule number two is majority wins. So, And rule number three is those who try to control, others would try to hide rule number one and two so that they can control the masses. So this is how it's been, and we know that the need for control comes out of insecurity. Because I, for my, for one, I don't feel like I need to control people or others so that I can live happily. I feel that if I'm if I'm love based, if I offer my services to others, they will offer their services to me, and it will be a win-win situation. So this is what I believe in, but my soul apparently comes from fifth or sixth dimension, Arcturian. Arc I'm an Arcturian, basically. This is what Simon Parks told me. And I kind of feel that way, too, because I think Arcturian philosophy is kind of jive with what I think, what I, the things that I like to think about. So this makes sense. But that's just, just me. So this controlling thing, we have this on this planet. There are beings who like to control others because they feel insecure or they suffered some kind of a blueprint of control in the past. And I was, in preparation for this show, I was reading this book called Prism of Lyra. Have you guys read this book by any chance? I haven't even heard of it. No. Okay. Oh, okay. I think it's... 
it's pretty much a uh, must read for guys, folks like us, because it talks about the galactic history of humanity, and I think this is very important because if you don't know, if we don't know our where we come from, then of we, this is a very old concept, so we know this already. The thing is. What's in this book is the is a very particular story of where we come from, and apparently they're saying, according to their version, we come from the constellation of Lyra or Lyra, L Y R A. That's where everything started, and this very title of the book, Prism of Lyra, this is a metaphor for a a literal prism, which is. Which uh, which is a white hole they they call it, and they're saying some kind of a very primal white light pass or white light or consciousness decided to pass through this prism of Lyra, so to speak, and doing this just like a prism, glass prism, it create it fractured the white light into seven different rays, okay, and each ray created a different type of consciousness and dimension. And so that's how, I'm kind of summarizing here, uh, certain dimensions got created from one to seven dimensions they're talking, they, they mention. And this was done to, for, as an experiment or some kind of an experience. But the thing is, what happened is, these these fractured lights and consciousness and dimensions eventually created star systems and planets. And what happened is initially a non-physical beings or consciousnesses were created who are called the founders. And I assume that the, originally there were seven seven founders because there were seven rays, and each ray kind of created a different kind kind of reality. And what happened is, eventually, for whatever reasons, the humanoid form was selected as a standard for consciousness evolution, and everything, even the non-physical beings, when they would when they would choose to lower their frequency and manifest in a, in a physical form, they would choose to be in a humanoid form for some reason. So from the very inception on Lyra, there was this humanoid, humanoid consciousness developing there. And, and they have the, these, all these stories of Orion, Sirius, Sirius uh, um, there's a few other names I forget, but basically, let me just ask you a question, guys. Uh, you you guys know about the Zechariah Sitchin books and the Anunnaki, right? And the Anunnaki in Sumerian means those from heaven came, which basically translates into ET or ex extraterrestrial. So, do you have any idea who these Anunnaki are, and what do they look like? Yes. Well, um, they, it seems, it is said that they do look humanoid, but they are giants. Isn't okay. That, uh, hmm. That's one of the, one of the ideas that people have. It may be correct, I'm not sure. Nancy, do you have any idea about this? Well, the, the only, I've never been drawn to understanding them or even being kind of interested in them. But Anelia Benz had an interesting thing. She was going through her records, telephone records, the recordings of sessions she's had with people, and she comes across one, and she doesn't even remember doing it. And to sum it up, oh, yeah. it was uh, her uh, telling somebody that when the Anunnaki were here, which is uh, an extraterrestrial group that is based on leadership and peons. In other words, you've got a leadership group and then everybody else is a worker bee. That right. when they mucked with human DNA, right. their own, they left that DNA here on the planet. 
And as human beings have evolved and become more enlightened, it's causing a problem back on the home planet of the Anunnaki in that the worker bees are suddenly becoming aware and awake. And that it's right. caused much problems in the Anunnaki uh, social structure, economy probably too, and politics, I guess. And they're, they, they actually considered coming back and wiping out everybody to stop this. But for whatever reason, she, I don't remember the reason, but she was saying that that was not an option to them. So um, my feeling is, is that we've, we've been hit with a lot of ETs mucking with DNA, and every time they put their own DNA with us, the human beings are being created that have uh, a su superior DNA matrix because it incorporates so many of at least 12 uh, star systems, star societies, and that they underestimated the power of the DNA to communicate in that DNA is really a biological internet within the human body, but more beyond that, it also is a communication device to other people that have the same DNA. We're all connected through DNA. And it's one thing to be on an earth and connected that way. It's another to be, on an, to be connected to all these solar systems, these star systems. And I believe that that was a plan put in operation by consciousnesses that are beyond, you know, the, the lower level, like human beings or Anunnaki or Octarian or any of the others, that it was a way of saying, okay, we've got all these wars that have been going on for eons of millenniums, and the reason is, is that they don't see themselves as family. So what if we make them family by uniting all of their DNA in one species? And I think that is the human species, so that the human species can now stand up and talk for everybody because they're all family. That's just my take on it. Right, but does that do? Do you understand where the Anunnaki came from? Uh, you mean which star system? No. Yeah, see, that's the thing. I, I, they, I think Zechari Zechariah Sitchin talks about the Nibiru, but that seems more like a like a spaceship rather than a planet because it goes the wrong direction and it goes in and out in a very anomalous fashion. So it doesn't really explain where this com where this species Anunnaki comes from because and I think that the term Anunnaki is not a name because it's Sumerian for ET so that doesn't explain who they are really so reading through the prism of Lyra I think I kind of know who the Anunnaki really were and they were basically Syrians and in this book they're talking about the origin of human consciousness on the star system of Lyra, then it moved to Vega, then they talk, they talk about this apex planet, not exactly sure what that is, but they, they detail it in the book. Then it moves to Sirius, Orion, Pleiades, Arcturus, and Zeta, Zeta Reticuli. This is, the, this is the flow of events. I'm looking at the book right now so that I can speak better, a little bit better. And and the way Earth's galactic family is, is composed of all of these folks from all these star systems I just, I just mentioned. And what happened is these are a various different dimensional star systems and beings. They're not, they're not all 3D. But they were experiencing those original rays, the seven rays I mentioned earlier, and the consciousness created through the prism of Lyra, and they were experiencing duality for the first time, and they 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 talk about uh, basically negative polarity, positive polarity, and an integrative point that that kind of combines the two, and this is like this is similar to creating a triangle. Okay, this, this is why. The Syrian people, they love the, the symbol of triangle. I think it's one of their favorite uh, symbols. So because they 
they they experienced polarity and they unified it and advanced that way. The thing, what what's interesting is that when this was happening, all these they were actually developing through these star systems and jumping from one star system to another. This is like just you know you're 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 evolving from one star system to another and expanding and creating different subtly different uh, experiences of archetype experiences that we still have in our DNA. For instance, the Orion, they were the main battleground for the challenge of polarity integration. Okay, so a lot of fights happen on Orion, and we have all those memories in our DNA. And the important point that I'm trying to get to here through all this is that the Zechariah Sitchin books try to promote the fact that uh, the Anunnaki were the gods who created human beings. So this would be sort of a misperception because the it's actually the Pleiadians that came originally from Sirius, Sirius and they broke off from Sirius and some of them came to Earth and stayed here. This is a long time back. This is a long before other things happened. Other beings came here. They were one of the first to come and stay on Earth. And when they were here, they wouldn't evolve to adjust to Earth's environment very well. So what they were doing, they were injecting primate DNA into their bodies. And this way they were coping better. So this primate DNA stayed in their, in their DNA. So what happened is later on, the thing you just covered, that there were so many battles that, that they tried to create a species that would be able to integrate all the hostility and everything together. And that was the Earth-human experiment. And when this was happening, uh, probably 22 different species, according to Corey Good or, and others, contributed to this. And... Pleiadians were called in at this time because they had the primate DNA in their bodies. So this primate DNA was somehow very important, according to this book. Consequently, Pleiadians became the stewards of humanity, and they've been watching us ever since. Same, same with, the, with the Orion folks and Syrian guys. But they have their own agendas because they went through a lot, lot of negativity and uh, service to self environments and so they had battles and terrible trauma that they suffered they blew up a planet all these traumatized all these trauma is still in our DNA that needs to be cleansed somehow so this is what creates our current situation on earth which is supposed to right now I think we're going through this transitional shift the paradigm shift so that will actually integrate all these Syrians, Orion, Zeta, Reticuli, uh, Pleiadians, and others, Lyrans and Dagans, whoever is here. And so when, you, when you're talking about all these ETs mucking with us in the, our reality, trying to do this, that all of those things are actually coming from the seven star systems that I mentioned. And it's events happening there. One bran Somebody branching off from here to there and then fighting with those guys here, moving to here, stuff like that happened. So, the point is, uh, if we try to understand who is our gods, who's our god, if our, our creators, it will be more Pleiadians than the Anunnaki or Syrians, whoever Anunnaki really is. I, I'm assuming it's Syrians. So, um, so, one of the Syrian characteristics and Orion char characteristics, and when I say Syrian or Orion, I'm talking about the negative faction because there are factions among all of the all of the different beings. Not there's nobody that's all bad. Everybody's broken into fact factions. So this is another important thing to understand. So there are factions in the Illuminati who are, I think, also Syrians. And the, those guys in the Vatican, the Jesuits, they are also Syrians. 
but they may not be the same faction. So they have this DNA thing going on that makes them automatically control freaks. They they feel that Orion guys have this also, that they need to control Earth and it's, it's destiny. If they can't do it, they're just losers. That's how they feel. So they must, they just vie for control. So there's control for, you know, between, the, there's probably a battle between the Syrians and the Orion guys because they all have this kind of DNA in them. And we need to understand all this, I think, in order to resolve our predicament here. So does that, does this seem relevant to our discussion? Nancy, you want to go there? Um, Wake up, Nancy. No, I'm, I'm kind of looking <laughs> it because I'm sort of like, I could give you a different history. You know, I mean, I could probably give you ten different histories, maybe more. I, Thank you. I, I, I've been through some of those as well. But I don't know that it matters. I don't know that, you see, I, I, I feel like we're in such a different place in space and time that we do not need to go back and rehash old history, old karma. To me, this is a, you know, a, a new start. This generation with the star children coming in, this is a new start. Forget everything that's gone behind. You don't have to forget it, but don't let it influence you because you you the, 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 you can't do anything about the past. You can't do anything about well. You can do. We know we can do things about the past. But basically, your your PowerPoint is the present. So, is it more important to understand the Lyra history versus well the the Nazi history? W what history do you want to try to deal with? And does any of it matter? What matters is where we are now and where we're going. That, that that's kind of why how I look at it. Okay. Now, I woke up with a thought. Now it's very interesting that you bring this up because synchronicity is just incredible. Um, I woke up with this thought, and it has accompanied me the whole day, for some weird reason. I don't know where it came from, but the thought practically is very simple. Nothing really matters. What matters is it just literally was so random in my head, and I thought what really matters is to practice love and to focus on what is good now, I know that sounds very mm, trivial maybe but when practically when we get stuck in the stories now these stories can be true they may not be there are realities that we see like what happened you know with the Nazis in World War One, World War Two, all these other things and all the other tragedies and traumas that have happened in our known history Yes, they're important to know because, you know, you learn from past mistakes and you learn from history. But just like Nancy said, I think the only way to move forward is to really think about how can we make, how, how can we influence the present right now? This keeps getting stronger and stronger in my mind in the sense that I respect people's trauma. I respect my own trauma and we have to... Not forget it in the sense that it's important to learn from it so it does not repeat, whether it's towards ourselves or towards other people. But yes, focusing on the present, I think that's where the magic lies. So what can we do in this exact instant, in, instance to change the next instance? So, yeah, I think, I think that's what's really more relevant. About, and of course, it's very interesting. I mean, I find all these things very interesting. I, they intrigue me very much. But just like Nazi said... There are so many versions that you get to the point where, I mean, I, I have to admit it, I'll say it even, you know, on air. I still find it very interesting. I've been interested in it, but I am a little bit turned off. And this is, I'm tired because everyone is saying something different. And I noticed that it has consumed my energy because, you, you know, you take time to read and try to understand instead of focusing on what you can do to actually make the change right now. Something Alex Collier said that I liked, he said, energy flows where focus goes. And I believe that. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, that's what I think. So it's sort of like distraction. 
In okay. other words, if 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 you're looking at the past, then you're not looking at the present. That's that's what I look at it as. <laughs> you're killing me, Nancy. But I know I, it. I'm, I, so, I'm sorry, <laughs> Neil. But <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Can I do a little bit of a counterpoint to this? Absolutely. Okay. Basically, um, the reason I got into this was uh, I think that what I'm trying to cover is know thyself kind of thing. That what I observe here with my people around me is that they have a belief system that's very strong. And I think that belief system has flaws in it. And it, it limits people from knowing who they really are. So this is why I'm trying to give them a different kind of an angle. And this is not very familiar to the people that I know. And they, they don't understand. They never heard of galactic history and stuff like that. So I, that, from, uh, that's where I was coming from. But of course, if we want to get back to the present time, I think one of the most important things is something we already stated, is that power lies within us. Right. It's not it's not about Trump being the president and he's a savior and he's gonna make America good again. That's kind of lame. We cannot go for that program. So we would I would rather what I do is I talk I tell people I kind of jokingly tell people about the M field, the morphic resonance field of Sheldrick. And I believe that it, it really it works that way that we can Everything we say, everything we think and do kind of morphs the M field and we can manifest things that we want by holding a vision of it. And if we can collectively hold the same vision, what needs to happen now? For instance, uh, our old, old subjects such as the free energy, solar energy and uh, banking problem that we have, the fiat money and all those things we can, you know, collectively start focusing on the things that we want. We don't want to, to drive cars with gasoline anymore. And we can start talking about those utopian things, actually. For instance, the hidden, the suppressed technologies that the U.S. military and the, the co big corporations such as Northrop, uh, McDonald Douglas and uh, Skunk Works and those guys, they already have a whole lot of technology that Corey Good and guys, uh, uh, Randy Kramer, Michael Sala, these guys talk about that the military uses in the, in the breakaway space civilization programs. And they even have, you know, Corey Good and Randy Kramer and actually many others, quite a few others stated that the, they have a age regression program in these space programs. So they take a person, they make a contract with that person, and then, then they say that you will serve us for 20 years or 40 years. It depends on the contract. And then they age regress that person and returns them. And this is what happened to Corey Good, Randy Kramer, um, there's probably a couple of guys, other guys I can't remember the names right now, but this is pretty standard. So, you know, that sounds like, you know, beyond Star Trek, Star Trek, that, you know, people can actually age regress. They, you know, so Corey Good, he was taken maybe when he was 20, and then he spent 20 hours in space. Then he became 40, and then he was age regressed back to whatever age, which is very weird because now he has so much experience, but he looks much younger. So this creates all kinds of anomalies. And well, it's not, we it's, not, it's not so much age regression. They send him back in time to when he was 20 again. I see. Is that how it is done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, okay. yeah they, take him, they take him out and they, they go off into space for 20 years th that time. And then they just okay. simply send them back into time, you know, a second after they took them, and now they're back in their beds, and they're going like, did something just happen? But they're but the same it, age they were at 20, so it is age regression, but not because they're doing age regression, but because they're doing time regression. Okay. But, um, Nancy, am I correct in saying that 
Corey said that some, their body ha has to be put in a state that it doesn't move for a week or so, so they can do the age of time regression. They have to be in a coma state for... I don't, I don't know. I, I don't okay. know. It doesn't really matter, but they have this kind of technology that sounds well, pretty... Let me, let me just point something out to you that you, you might probably n never thought about. Um, okay. First off, when we talk about the history and we give the people the history of the planet and that they've been mucked with and their DNA, all that, to me that's all excuse. It gives them an excuse for being who they are. Oh, poor me, I had the Anunnaki muck with my DNA. Okay? It's <laughs> not right. a story, it's an excuse for not becoming who you are. Now, the right. second thing is this, this secret space program, the Breakaway Civilization. We have a tendency to look at something like that and say, oh, wow, they've got age regression. Oh, wow, they can replace your body. Oh, wow, they've got clones. Oh, wow, they've got uh, replicators. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, who the hell are these people? Who the hell are they? Are they better than I am? I don't think so. And I think what's happened is that by breaking away the, the, the population like that, the pe I, Walt said this to me, and he said it facetiously, but it, 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 it strikes me, it keeps coming back to me as being what's really happening here. In uh, Star Trek, uh, the uh, generation Star Trek, there was a character named Q, and he was from the Q Continuum. And the Q Continuum were like semi-gods, and they could do all the things, time travel, psychic stuff, all, all the stuff, you know, they were gods, okay? And Walt says to me, while the space, the breakaway space, uh, community became Star Trek, the people on Earth became the Q continuum. And that's what I think is happening. It doesn't matter who's out there. It doesn't matter that there's a breakaway civilization. All that matters is that we concentrate on ourselves and who we are right here, right now, on planet Earth. Because I go back to the Garden of Eden. It's all riddles. It's everything is a riddle. Everything is a story. Everything is trying to, to make sense of a story and a riddle. And the riddle that is here for humanity is that we took, we, through, through Eve, represented by Eve, we decided that we wanted to take from the tree of knowledge. The demonic being, if it was demonic at all, maybe it was the light being for all we know, said if you take from the light from the tree of knowledge then you will know the difference between good and evil and therefore be like gods. So we get tossed out of the Garden of Eden by God. Well, you've taken from the tree of knowledge. Now you better damn well understand life. And so we go through this life experience and we learn all these things and we have all these histories and we do all these evil things. And finally, somebody starts to wake up and they're going, like in the 60s, whoa, something is definitely wrong here. What's wrong here? Oh, my gosh. I don't know what's wrong, but let's look into it. And I was one of those people. Now, the, the, the transitional point was, of course, the Kennedy assassination. But the reality is that suddenly a bunch of people started looking at reality much differently. They weren't accepting it as the story. So they go on and they try to create new storylines. What if, what if, what if, what if? Those people started a movement that became disruptive of the matrix that was also simultaneously getting thicker and thicker to, to gain more and more control. We, are, have, we have the ability, and we can see this in the kids, the star kids. If you really want to see where we're going, you look at the children. What are they doing? Where are they going? Now, I want to just take a second here because one thing that the kids are doing that just blew me right out of the water. I'm going to read this. It's, it's notes that I took from an, a, an article, okay? A federal judge gave 21 Americans between the age of 9 and 20 the green light to sue the federal government for its inaction on climate change. The lawsuit challenges federal decisions made on a vast set of topics, including carbon dioxide emissions from power plants and vehicles, extraction of fossil fuels on federal land, and how much to charge for its use, tax breaks, subsidi subsidies for the fossil fuel in industry, funding of fossil fuel infrastructure, and construction of maritime marine coal terminal projects. 
The amended lawsuit was filed in September of 2015 by attorneys with the environmental group Earth Guardians and the 21 students supported by the nonprofit Our Children's Trust. It alleges that the government has violated the plaintiff's Fifth Amendment guarantees of due process and equal protection, the Ninth Amendment's assurance of unenumerated rights preserved for the people, and the public trust doctrine. The federal government is not upholding our rights to life, liberty, and property, one of the participants said. The next president doesn't even acknowledge that climate change is happening, but I'm going to tell, be here a lot longer than he is. The suit named President Obama and several federal departments and agency heads as defendants. Three industry groups, the National Association of Manufacturers, the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, and the American Petro- Petroleum Institute joined the suit, suit on behalf of the government and tried to have it dismissed. Going through the executive branch is not working, so we're going to, through the judicial branch to force the executive branch to be held accountable. This is a major legal interpretation of the power of the people. So I, I, I look at it and I see that, and these things don't normally get talked about. You know, they just get buried. But I see the, I mean, even even the, um, the pipeline uh, protesting, that started with the kids. The kids went to the elders and said, hey, look at they're doing this. You've got to help us. And so the elders started getting involved in it. But then the kids actually, you know, took the documents saying we're not going to stand for this legal documents that the elders had already sent in but never were acknowledged by the um, uh, uh, Corps of Engineers and the um, people that were trying to get the pipeline in. And so the kids went to Washington, D.C. and officially delivered it, hand-delivered it to the um, agency that was supposedly responsible for it. But what I'm saying to you here is, is that I think that we shouldn't even be much concerned about the breakaway civilization. It's just another story. You know, yes, they've got all this wonderful stuff, but yes, we've got that wonderful stuff as soon as we access our own internal powers. And I think it's post accessing of the internal powers is what changed that election. That will exactly. Makes sense to me. You can't have a utopia if you don't change within first. Because we can have all these fancy gadgets, but if, if, if society doesn't change as a collective mm, to evolve and be a better society where everyone can flourish and everyone can ha- cooperate and share and help each other, then what are we going to do with all this fancy stuff? Yes, it's going to definitely be positive for the environment, but it's not. Re- if you just look at the internet, for example. Look at how communication has become so easy. Many people use it in such a negative way. Um, this is very telling. So yes, it would be That's great to have a new utopia. Yeah. So it would be great to have better technology uh, that can be used correctly, but it can only be used correctly if society as a whole becomes a utopian society. From within. So, I mean, these are all beautiful thoughts, and I agree with you totally, and it's, I value it very much. But I think, again, as Nancy said, I, 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 I concur with her. There's a lot of stuff that, t- to me, is a distraction. And, no, uh, let me ask you a question. Sure. What would you like to see in your, rea- in your immediate changed reality? Do you have a vision of a future? Well, if my vision is quite simple yet maybe not that simple I just want to be able to see kindness in people's eyes towards each other tolerance um, cooperation I just see so much anger and so much irritation Um, people are rude to each other even though they're strangers just to let go of that anger let go of that fear this to me this is all I ask for, because I think at the moment that you can let go, we all can let go of that, then it's just going to be like a domino effect. That's can you, can what you I think, would like. Can you think of a catalyst that would make it happen very quickly? 
Well, uh, one thing that comes to mind, which is maybe not that positive, um, that, you know, some sort of chaotic event. I mean, that's what comes to my mind right now. I know it sounds, that sounds very negative, but sometimes chaos and destruction is actually a symbol of rebirth and change for the positive. So if people, I mean, if we have to get to that point, that's kind of sad. But it seems to be that we need to be pushed into that direction. I personally believe that there's a better way where it, it's the influence of the collective consciousness. So I think the light workers all over the world continue, have to continue doing what they're doing. The children, as Nancy said, the star children, they're doing their job superbly. And they will continue doing it. They're going to get stronger. They're going to get more experience as they you know, progress with age. Um, hopefully, we don't have to get to that point. But if you're asking me of a catalyst, then I would say some, a chaotic event, something that would shatter people's reality and wake them up abruptly and, and in, a, in a blunt way. Um, as we can see in our personal lives, there are a lot of catalysts where you, know, you have a death in the family or you have a divorce or you have anything negative that is a blessing in disguise in a way, if I can, if I can use that term. So that would be the catalyst. I just hope that we don't Nora, get to that point. Nora, you don't think we've had enough catalysts? Well, apparently not, Nancy. I believe we did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I believe we did. Saying, yeah, I'm going like, first off, you said, you know, look in their eyes. And I had this image when he asked about the catalyst. I had this image of looking in a stranger's eyes and seeing them recognize me, yeah. acknowledge me, to feel this connection to that person. So that, you know, and it's the same thing you alluded to. Um, the catalysts of, I think that they've already been there. I think that's why so many people are waking up. Yes, but that's what I'm saying, that, that if that has happened, then good. So what, I, what, I, um, what I'm more focused on and what I believe is going to help is the influence of the collective consciousness. So everyone who is already working in that energy, it's going to keep waking people up. But it's going to take maybe some time. We don't know. People are waking up slowly but surely. Um, I, I do hope, honestly, that the catalyst has happened and that we don't need that. I just hope we don't need that because I think we've had enough. Well, let, um, me, let, me, let me just give you an example of what I think is what I, what I see as being the key, what's, what's really happening, okay? Um, I'm sitting in the airport. And this family um, with a uh, big old carriage thing that was full of all sorts of luggage and stuff and a, and a baby. And they did look ethnic. What ethnic? I can't even tell you. They just, you know, looked ethnic. They were dressing a little bit different, the, the parents. And then there was these two children. And they were probably 10-ish, between, between 10 and 10, well, more like 10, I think. It's hard to tell nowadays with these kids. And they may have been twins, even though they weren't identical. And as soon as I laid eyes on them, I went, ooh, I got two star kids in front of me. And so I've, I've learned that sometimes to make a connection, you know, especially me, that when I make a connection, I have to be very careful that I don't get them upset because I'm too powerful. You know, I mean, I really get inside them. And mm -hmm. so I was just sort of sitting there, and I'm out of the corner of my eye, I'm watching them, and they're, you know, distracted and everything. And finally they started settling down, and I kind of turned towards them. They weren't looking at me, and I sent them, you know, just love energy, you know, respect, acknowledgement. I know who you guys are, right? And then I let it go, and I go back to looking out the window, and I'm watching the planes come in, and I look back in, and they're both staring at me. They oh. Both. They had, they had felt it. They knew. And they're looking at me like they recognize me, only they don't really understand what they're seeing. And if we can do that for each, and each of these kids, you know, they will teach the parents to be not fearful. Because kids are not full of fear. Even if they, they, you know, things frighten them. They don't have this long, enduring fear in them. In, in my experience, you know, working yeah, yeah. with these kids. Nancy, you just said something very in interesting to me. You said you were very powerful, and you said it without ego, I think. So I think that's very important for people to step into their power and acknowledge their own power. That's the key. Right. 
I agree. It, one more thing, Nancy. Can I ask uh, Colleen to give her vision of the immediate future or long-term future? Doesn't matter. Ask Colleen. <laughs> Colleen. Colleen, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I have. Tell us your vision that you might have, the future or present that you'd like to see now, that we have a new timeline, new positive timeline. Well, the one I'd like to see is where we all get along. We are all fair and just and accepting of each other. Um, that instead of seeing all the differences, we see each other as part of ourselves, uh, as well as our connection with the earth, and that we don't have to work for others, that we work for ourselves, doing things we love doing. Um, and yeah, I love the gadgets myself, but I'd like to see them so that they're not dangerous, they're not destroying the earth, um, and that we, in realizing our connection to everything, we realize that we are spirit that just happens to be in this physical existence at this particular time whatever time that is. That's beautiful. my vision of the future. But it's a long road to hoe. <laughs> We're getting there. Well, I think we're already there, but <laughs> it's, that's just me. The optimistic <laughs> me. That's awesome. What about yeah. you, Neil? What do you see? Uh, uh, one of the things that Colleen said, that understanding that there's no separation in everybody I'm talking to is actually me, another me. So this is, uh, we, uh, we can understand this on an intellectual level, but then we can actually learn to feel this, that when you look at the stars, you're actually looking at yourself. The stars, the whole universe is actually you. You're not this little body on the talking on the radio, you know, that uh, I think this understanding is also necessary. These are, I think these are fifth dimensional or sixth dimensional ideologies. For instance, sixth dimension is the consciousness. You become sixth dimensional consciousness when you understand that the dimension itself is, is you and the con your consciousness. So, uh, the oneness of everything, if we could, if we would be more tolerant of one another's views and not get stuck with your belief system. And I think one of the important things for us to understand right now is that most of our belief systems are not adequate. They may not be wrong, but they're, they, they're not sufficient. I think we're getting into a deeper reality where we need to question our belief systems all over again, every one of us, so that we understand that where we're stuck with our consciousness, so that this way we can open, loosen ourselves, and not take everything so seriously, and lose, you know, kind of lose our fear of survival and money and all those things. That would be my take. Sounds good to me. Very nice. Yes. Well, you, Nor. Well, you just yeah, said it. Yeah, I, yeah. I just and I, I, I agree with uh, both, both. I mean, all three of you. It's uh, and I think another thing that's very important that Colleen mentioned, spot on, our connection to Mother Earth, because we need to understand that as physical beings, because we have the physic, the spirit, and the and the physical, which are one at the end. Um, we need to establish a stronger connection to the Earth, because without the Earth, we cannot have this physical experience so as long as we're here there's obviously a reason so as long as we're here we should try to live this life and not be all over the place and I'm a very I mean I'm, a, I'm a, an air sign so my head is up in the clouds a lot and I need to 
do things that keep me grounded. And I'm sure that people who are like that understand that it's difficult. So this is a, I think this is extremely important to try to keep, try to find ways to stay grounded because that keeps us focused on our mission, on what we are supposed to do here on the physical plane. I think that's also very important. So it's a balance between the two. Well, we're at the end of the show. Um, we always get into such interesting things. And I, I, this, these, like I say, the, the, the importance of these shows isn't how many people are listening. The importance of these shows is that we have them, that we talk about these things, that we make our brains go places maybe we wouldn't go if we weren't here together to be able to influence that collective consciousness. Um, totally agree. Yeah. 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 So I, I am deeply appreciative of, of all three of you and, and the audience that does participate with us. I mean, they go to the same place we go. And like I say, there's, it's, it's all story, it's all riddle, but we have to maintain our focus on the present and what we want, what we want to see. Right, right. And we all sort of want to see the same thing. Um, I think it's already happening. Uh, Colleen, she's going. We're going to have to pull her in, kicking and screaming. Are you sure it's happened? Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> we talk about this. <laughs> um, love you guys, um, Colleen. What do you got coming up, hon? Uh, coming up next is Haggy reads for you, and I'm reading Noam Chomsky's book because we say so. Uh, what's that about? What's that about? Awesome. He talks about what's going on in the world of politics and behind the scenes and who owns the world and what sorts of things we as people of the United States and our government uh, do around the world and what the ramifications of that are and our, oh my gosh, surprise at those ramifications. Um, he uh, does a very good job covering things that mainstream media does not cover and actually lies to us about. And then after that is fans of Whitley Strieber's show. And Whitley's got Dreaming Wide Awake by David J. Brown. Uh, it's a book about lucid dreaming and what that's all about. And then Jeremy Vaney's got Do We Talk to Ourselves Through High Strangeness? And that's coming up after that. And then JP takes over uh, for Sean David Morton's show Strange Universe. And then tonight at 10 o'clock, is Max Steele's show. So that's what's coming up. Awesome. We hope you hang in with we'll the radio and Haggy Shack, and um, we'll see you next week. Um, again, guys, be safe, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate you. And um, any last words from either of you? All of you. Colleen, Laura? Love you all. Thank you so much for your yeah. great hours. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, everybody. Bye Thank bye. you all. Great bye show. Bye. Excellent. Bye. See you next week. Be safe. Bye bye. Be safe. Thank you for visiting. You have been listening to World Talk with Friends, a Haggy Shack radio production simulcast over the Wolf Spirit Media Network.